MBK 2 19 the core of Israeli chapter 19 the core of Israeli after Jayadratha's death the core of warriors expressed their sorrow seeing so many of their number slain the soldiers condemned Dhritarashtra and his son censuring them for their wicked policies the warriors praised Yudhishthira and his brothers sunk in despair Doryodhan rode back to his camp he sat on the terrace of his chariot with his head lowered unable to look at anyone his mind dwelt only on the day's events. Surely there was no warrior equal to Arjuna. Neither Drona, Kripa, nor even Karna could stand before him. Indeed, the whole army combined could not stop him from killing Jayadratha or Yodun wept in his agony. Entering his tent he took his seat, followed by Drona and his other generals. No music played in his camp, and the bards were silent. Struggling to maintain his composure, the core of a prince addressed Drona in a voice strained with grief. O preceptor, behold the carnage among the kings who have come to our side. Even the mighty Bishmala is prostrate on the battlefield. The Pandavas have slaughtered seven Akshohinis of our troops. Today your disciple fulfilled his vow and killed Jayadratha, even though you opposed him with an impenetrable array of troops. Many lords of the earth, desiring to do us good, have gone to Yamaraja's abode. How can I repay my debt to them? Being nothing more than a coward, I have destroyed my friends and relatives. The earth should swallow me, covetous, sinful and opposed to virtue as I am. My own grandsire lies on a bed of arrows due to my wicked desires. What will he say when he meets me in the next world or Yodun stopped speaking and wept openly? He buried his head in his hands and cried out the names of his slain brothers Karna came over and comforted him. Gradually he gained control of himself and sat up. He sat staring straight ahead for some time, wringing his hands and breathing heavily. His mind moved between despair and the desire for revenge. All was not lost. The core of us still had drawn up Karna, Ashvathama, and other powerful heroes. Perhaps they could yet defeat the Pandavas, or at least capture or kill Yudhishthira. In any circumstance, surrender was impossible. It would be better to be slain down to the last man than to hand over the kingdom to the Pandavas after all this. That was the least the surviving Kauravas could do to repay their slain colleagues. With tears running down his face, Doryodhan continued, O foremost of warriors, I swear that I will obtain peace only by slaying the Pandavas or by being slain by them. I will follow the path taken by our friends and relatives. Seeing us overpowered by our enemies, our partisans are losing faith in our power. They are openly praising the Pandavas. With Visma fallen and you fighting only mildly, O Preceptor, our troops think we have no protector. It seems that Karna alone is anxious for our success. Like a fool I have depended on one who is a friend only in words. Greedy for wealth and sinful, my mind blinded by desire, I have placed my hopes where they were bound to be thwarted. As a result, Jayadratha and so many other great kings all lie dead on the battlefield. O Drona, permit me therefore to lay down my life in battle, just as all these men have done, Drona removed his helmet and long gloves, placing them by his side. His sinewy arms were lacerated with arrow wounds, and skilled physicians applied herbal dressings to the cuts, but Doryodhan's reproachful words stung him more than the wounds. He turned to the prince. Why, O king? Do you pierce me with words as sharp as darts? I have repeatedly told you that no one can defeat Arjuna in battle. Seeing Bhishma brought down I am convinced that we are doomed. The dice Shakuni threw against the Pandavas have returned against us as blazing arrows. Vidura warned you of this, but you did not heed him. He who ignores his well-wishers and goes his own way is stupid and is soon reduced to a pitiable condition. You have brought about this calamity upon us all by dragging Draupadi into the Karu assembly and insulting her. Such a sinful deed cannot go unpunished, Drona had heard enough from Doryodhan. He reminded him of every wicked act he had performed against the Pandavas, making it clear that the Kauravas had no one to blame but themselves for their present suffering. They had been warned many times that fighting the Pandavas would not result in success. Drona looked at Doryodhan and his surviving brothers Bhima had already slain half of them. The remainder were a sorry sight in their grief and frustration. Drona felt that it was still his duty to afford them whatever protection he could, but there was little hope. Standing up with his hand on his ivory-hilted sword, he said, Seeing me sinking in the ocean of the Pandavas' prowess, you should not enhance my grief, O king. 
Here now my final determination. I will not take off my armor again until all of the Panchalas are slain. My son will kill the Somakus. With those two armies gone, it may be possible for us to defeat the Pandavas, Drona indicated Kripla. Here is the invincible Acharya. Our enemies cannot kill him. Let him exert his full power to kill the kings who have sided with the Pandavas. O Doryodhan, worship Brahmins and offer them many gifts. Make offerings into the sacred fire and propitiate the deities. We will make one last great effort. Tomorrow I will ride at the head of your army with my weapons ablaze. You will see me penetrate the pond of ranks like a lion entering a herd of cows. Cheered by Drona's words, the core of us slowly retired for the night, exhausted from the day's fighting Dhritarashtra sat silently on his throne. By his side Sanjaya gently dabbed his brow with a soft cloth soaked in cool water. The old king had lost consciousness when he heard how Bhima had slain over thirty of his sons in one day. Returning to consciousness he learned that Arjuna had succeeded in his vow to kill Jayadratha. Struck dumb with grief, he moaned softly. Was there any hope for the Kauravas when their entire force could not prevent Arjuna from reaching the scene who king? The blind monarch spoke in a voice barely rising above a whisper. O oh best of all my serpents, tell me how my surviving sons are now faring, having seen their army routed and Jayadratha slain. Day by day my fame dwindles. Numerous powerful warriors on my side are being killed. All this is due to the adverse influence of fate Dhritarashtra broke off, shaking his head. Arjuna smashed into our host, which was protected by Drona and Karna. Even the gods could not have stopped him. Surely he is as irresistible as the surging ocean. And then there is Bhima. Half my sons are dead. Bhima will not rest until he has killed the other half. In the meantime, Arjuna, aided by Drishtadyuna and Satyaki, will annihilate the other Karu heroes. It is hard to believe. At the beginning of the war, our army outnumbered the Pandavas two to one. Now only four of our eleven divisions remain to the Pandavas three. The odds are now almost equal, his head down, Dhritarashtra listened to Sanjaya described the conversation between Doryodhan and Drona. Hearing that the preceptor had again vowed to slay the Pandava forces, the old king became encouraged. The war was not over Drona and Karna were still alive, as well as Kripla, Ashvathama, and a number of other warriors. They would be burning with anger and a desire to avenge Jayadratha's death. Perhaps, too, Arjuna would be fatigued after exerting himself so tremendously. Things may yet turn the other way. Wars had often been won by rallying troops when all had seemed hopeless on Jaya. Seeing Dhritarashtra looking more hopeful, said, O king, you should not forget that Krishna is the Pandava's guide and protector. It was due to his help that Arjuna succeeded today. Your men have no hope if they oppose Keshava in battle. He is the unfailing defender of the righteous and the annihilator of the demonic. Steeped in sin and ignorant of virtue, your sons are bringing a terrible calamity upon themselves and their friends. Their single hope lies in returning the Pandava's rightful property. However, O King, I fear the opportunity for that has passed. This is your fault. It will result in a massive destruction of Kshatriyas. Dhritarashtra remembered the inconceivable form Krishna had displayed in the hall where he now sat. After that, he had heard about Krishna's many glories from the Rishis, Descriptians he had heard before. Trying to bring the king to his senses, the Rishis had again reminded him how Krishna had killed numerous Yusuras, who were capable of assuming forms at will and who had terrorized even the gods. Feeling a strange sense of peace as he thought of Krishna, Dhritarashtra said, Even if by chance we are able to defeat the Pandavas, we will still have to contend with Keshava. For their interest he will take up his irresistible discus and rush against my forces like the all-consuming fire of universal destruction. After destroying the Khorus he will offer the earth to Kunti. I do not see how we can attain victory Doryodhan is ignorant of Krishna's position and power. The faithless fool is a slave to his own senses. He can never understand the absolute truth. He is like a child who wishes to extinguish fire with his hands Arjuna and Krishna are united as one soul. Their aims and desires are one, and even the mighty Shiva cannot thwart them. Thinking of his son, the king again felt sorrow fill his heart. Would he ever see him again? It seemed unlikely. He would probably die in this battle. Yet the ways of fate were inscrutable. Even Krishna, it seemed, could not prevent Abhimanyu's death. 
Surely he could not have wanted that son of his dear friend and sister to die. Gripped by the duality of realizing the inevitable and yet hoping to resist it, the king rose from his seat and his servants led him away. He told Sanjaya to return the next day and recount any events of the night, and how the battle began again as the sun rose on the fourteenth day, Doryo Dun, seething as he recalled the events of the previous day, spoke with Karna. How was it possible for Arjuna to penetrate our ranks yesterday? Before your eyes he slew Jabiyantratha. Even with Krishna's devious trick, it should still not have been possible. My once vast army has been reduced to a pitiable few by Chakra's son. Surely this must be drawn as desire. I cannot accept that the preceptor is fighting to his full power. If he had opposed Arjuna with all his strength yesterday, then Jayantratha would not have been killed. Arjuna is exceedingly dear to the magnanimous Drona. Fool that I was, I believed him when he promised to protect Jayantratha. Now I am despairing, Karna did not agree. I do not think you should blame the preceptor. Heedless of his own life he fights our enemies furiously. It is not his fault that he failed to prevent Arjuna, guided by Krishna, from fulfilling his vow. Clad in impenetrable armor and wielding the Gandiva bow, he is formidable. It was no wonder to me that he overcame Drona. Furthermore, the preceptor is old and not so agile or quick. How can he contend with Arjuna on equal terms? Karna and Doryodhan were riding out on their chariots as they spoke. Ahead of them in the distance they saw the Pandava forces spread across the horizon. With their armor and weapons glinting in the sun, their army appeared like a sparkling sea. Their roars and Kong blasts were answered by the core of his warriors Karna put on his helmet as he continued. In my opinion, destiny is supreme. Despite our efforts and our numbers, and even though our army contains the greatest heroes, still, fate makes our endeavor futile. O King, a man afflicted by adverse fate finds all his exertions useless. We have constantly antagonized the Pandavas, yet they have always emerged unharmed. I do not see that they are superior to us in either intellect or power, nor do I feel that you have miscalculated through lack of understanding. It is fate alone that controls everything. If destiny has decreed that we should suffer reversals, then nothing in our power can alter that fact. Doryodhan remained silent. Perhaps Karna was right. Fortune had surely favored the Pandavas. But fortune was always flickering. Surely it was time it favored him. Drona had sworn to annihilate the Panchalas and Somakus, the major remnant of the Pandava army. If he kept his vow, then they might still attain victory. The prince clenched his teeth and looked at Drona, who was busy marshalling the troops into formation. It would not help if he censured him any more. Doryodhan's chariot reached the other Karu leaders and he issued orders and made arrangements. Having agreed upon a strategy for the day's fighting, the Kauravas formed themselves into an array shaped like a turtle. In response, the Pandavas aligned their troops in an arrangement resembling a shark. The two armies came together cheering, their weapons clashing as a huge cloud of dust rose above the battlefield. Determined to end the conflict as quickly as possible, Bhima sought out the remaining Kaurava princes. As he charged into the enemy ranks, he was surrounded by elephants and horsemen, who rained down their weapons on the roaring Pandava. As a fierce battle began, Drishtadyuna and the twins rushed against the Mantrika army. Sasharma and the remainder of the Samshaptakas, remembering their vow, challenged Arjuna Satyaki stayed close to Yudhishthira, protecting him along with Shikandi and other chariot fighters Drona encountered the Panchalas and showered them with tens of thousands of arrows. Invoking celestial weapons, he swiftly cut them down. A powerful king named Sibi, charging at the head of the Somakus, roared out his battle cry and challenged Drona. He struck him with thirty arrows and slew his charioteer. Drona was infuriated and replied with ten arrows made of steel. He slew Sibi's four horses, cut down his standard, and severed the king's head as he stood in the fight. Doryodhan ordered another charioteer onto Drona's chariot, and Drona continued to fight the Panchalas and Somakus together. Bhima was surrounded by a number of Korava princes. They assailed him from all sides with arrows. Not concerned about their attack, Bhima jumped down from his chariot and ran over to one of them. Leaping onto his chariot, he smashed him with his fists. With all his limbs broken the prince toppled lifeless from his chariot Bhima leapt down and raced over to another prince, striking and killing him in the same way Karna came to the Korava's protection, 
hurling a flaming dart at Bima as he ran across the field. Bima faced the dart and caught it, immediately hurling it back at Karna. As it flew toward Karna, Shakuni cut it down with a razor-headed shaft. Oblivious to the core of his arrows, Bima caught hold of another prince and killed him with one mighty slap. He then remounted his chariot and blew his conch. With a volley of gold-winged shafts he smashed the chariot of Dermida, another of Doryodun's brothers. Dermida ran over to his brother Discarna's chariot and leapt aboard. Both princes stood together firing their straight-flying arrows at Bima by the hundreds. Bima rushed at Discarna and demolished his chariot with a single mace blow. The two princes jumped clear, but Bima leapt down and pounded them with his fists. Struck repeatedly by Bima they both fell dead, their bodies pulverized. Seeing Bima raging among them like an all-destroying tempest, the Kauravas cried out in fear. Surely this is Rudra himself come as Bima for our annihilation. Let us flee for our lives, the soldiers ran wildly from Bima. No two were seen to be running together as they fled without looking back. Returning to his chariot, Bima fought with Doryodhan, Kripa and Karna. As he battled alone, a number of other Pandavan warriors came to his support and a violent struggle ensued. Elsewhere on the battlefield Somadatta encountered Satyaki. Enraged at his son's slaughter, the Karu leader bellowed, Why, O Satvita hero, have you forgotten the religious codes of warfare and taken to evil practices? How can a virtuous person strike one who has laid aside his weapons? This will lead to your downfall, O mean-minded one. You will now suffer the consequences of your vile act. I swear by my two sons that I will either kill you or be killed by you today. If this does not come to pass, then may I fall into dreadful hell. Stand ready, wretch, for I will now let go my deadliest weapons. So Madata blew his conch and roared like a lion. Satyaki was infuriated by his speech and he thundered back, O descendant of Karu, I am not afraid of you or your empty words. Why should one conversant with Kshatriya duty quake when confronted by such threats? Fight to your utmost power, either alone or with your supporters, and I will slay you. I killed your son along with many other powerful Khorus. Indeed, they have all been slain by the anger of the virtuous and ever truthful Yudhishthira. Having chosen him as your enemy, O Lord of Men, you too will follow the path they have taken. Guard yourself. I swear by Krishna's feet and by all my past pious acts that I will kill you today. Both men began to discharge volleys of arrows. Observing the fight from a distance, Doryodhan sent a large division of horsemen to support his old uncle. Ten thousand of them hemmed in Satyaki and covered him with arrows. Drishtadyana saw Satyaki's position and came to his aid, along with a great force of Pandava warriors. A deafening tumult arose as the two armies met. Somadatta concentrated his attack on Satyaki, sending a cluster of blood sucking shafts at him. The Vrishni hero responded with arrows that pierced Somadatta's armor and made him swoon. His charioteer carried him away from the fight. Rona rushed into the battle hoping to slay Satyaki. Shouting out his battle cry, he hurled powerful weapons at the Vrishni warrior, who was contending with the thousands of other fighters all around him. Yudhishthira and the twins, seeing Satyaki under attack by Drona, roared in anger and entered the fight. They assailed Drona from all sides and diverted his attack from Satyaki. Bhima and Drishtad Yuna joined them, and Doryodhan, Karna and Kripa came to support the core of us. With the heroes on both sides backed by numerous troops, a fierce and confused fight ensued. Arrows, darts, lances and other weapons flew through the air. Maces collided in showers of sparks and swords clashed. Wrathful warriors hacked and lunged at each other. The heads, limbs and entrails of slain warriors covered the ground. With screams and roars they fell upon each other, blinded by rage. Some way off, Gatotkacha was moving across the field. The Rakshasa was mounted on an eight-wheeled chariot made of black iron and spread with bear skins. Furnished with all types of weapons, it emitted a terrifying noise as it moved across the field. It was a celestial chariot, and it was drawn by beasts of the underworld who resembled elephants but who had horns and blazing red eyes. On its banner was a great black vulture with outspread wings and feet, and it gave off frightful screeches. Around its sides were red flags and rows of bones. Gatotka just stood on the chariot like a dark mountain. With his long fangs, arrow-shaped ears, unnatural eyes and bald head, his sight sent the core of our troops dashing away in terror. He was surrounded by an Akshohini of Rakshasa warriors armed with maces, spears, 
rock sentries. They advanced into battle with rowers that shook the earth. Seeing him advance, Ashvathama came before him. Proud of his ability with weapons, he stood unmoving as the Rakshasas approached Gautatkacha left and used his mystic powers to make a shower of rocks fall on Ashvathama and the soldiers supporting him. With the stones fell arrows, spears, axes and clubs. Releasing an arrow charged with mantras, Ashvathama checked the downpour Gautatkacha and released fifty shafts that dug into Ashvathama's armor and body Drona's son, maintaining his equilibrium, replied with a dozen arrows that cut into the Rakshasa Gautatkacha, rocked by the assault, took up a thousand spoke wheel with a razor sharp edge. It shone like fire and was studded with gems. Spinning it, the Rakshasa hurled it at Ashvathama. With twenty crescent headed shafts, Ashvathama broke the wheel to pieces. It fell uselessly to the ground like the purposes of a man under the influence of adverse destiny. Gautatkacha followed the attack with a volley of shafts that completely covered Ashvathama. The Rakshasa's son, Enjinaparva, then came to his side and joined the assault on Ashvathama. He attacked him with hundreds of long arrows fitted with barbed heads and soaked in oil. Swallowed by shafts, Ashvathama appeared like Mount Meru drenched by a shower of rain. His charioteer swiftly wheeled his chariot around, and as he came clear of the onslaught, he released an arrow that cut down Engine Aparva's standard. With two more shafts he slew his two charioteers. He then killed his horses, and with another razor-faced arrow cut apart his bow. Engine Aparva leapt from his chariot brandishing his scimitar embellished with golden stars, but he had hardly fixed his gaze on Ashvathama before Drona's son cut the weapon apart with three arrows. The Rakshasa took up a mace stacked with gold. Swinging it around, he hurled it at Ashvathama, who broke it to pieces with his arrows. Enjinaparva jumped into the sky and rained down trees and rocks onto his opponent. At the same time, Gautatkacha fired thousands of fire-tip shafts at Ashvathama. Simultaneously countering Gautatkacha's attack and fighting Enjinaparva, Ashvathama shot arrows into the air which pierced Enjinaparva all over his body. As the Rakshasa descended to the ground, Ashvathama released a broad-headed shaft with all his strength. Empowered by mantras, the shaft tore off Engine Aparva's head, which fell to the earth like a black boulder, its bright earrings gleaming like seams of gold. Shaking with grief and rage, Gautatkacha roared, Stand and fight. You will not escape alive from me today, Ashvathama lowered his bow and replied derisively, O celestially powerful one, you should fight with others. As Bhima's offspring you are like my son. It is improper for me to fight you, nor do I feel angry with you. Leave now while I still feel kindly disposed toward you, for a man excited by rage may kill even his own self. Gautatkacha was even more incensed and he seemed to blaze as he bellowed, What? Am I like an ordinary man that you are trying to frighten me with your words? I am the emperor of the Rakshasas. My prowess is no less than that of the ten-headed Ravanut. O oh, son of Drona, stay for only a moment more in this fight and I will put an end to your life. The maddened Rakshasa fired his long arrows at Ashvathama, but Drona's son struck them all down before they could reach him. Both warriors released clouds of arrows which appeared to fight each other in the sky. The shafts collided, creating sparks and fire that illuminated the battlefield. By his mystic power, Gautatkacha disappeared from view and suddenly assumed the shape of a towering mountain abounding in peaks and trees. At its summit was a fountain that incessantly showered spears, darts, swords and heavy clubs. Remaining calm, Ashvathama invoked the Vajra weapon which destroyed the Rakshasa's illusion Gautatkacha again appeared in the sky wielding his bow. With his numerous gold ornaments he seemed like a blue cloud adorned with a rainbow. He invoked a weapon that sent a thick shower of rocks onto Ashvathama. The heavy stones shook the earth as they fell. Reciting ancient incantations, Ashvathama at once invoked the Vaya Vaya weapon. Unlimited numbers of arrows flew from his bow and smashed all the rocks as they fell from the sky. With the divine wind weapon Ashvathama went on to assail the Rakshasa army and destroyed thousands of them Gautatkacha returned to the ground and mounted his chariot. Surrounded by a host of Rakshasas, who had the heads of lions and tigers and rode upon fearful-looking animals, he charged Ashvathama stood firm as the hordes rushed toward him screaming in discordant voices. 
led by Bhima's son, they appeared like an army of hideous-looking ghosts and spirits with Rudra their head out hot catch or least ten arrows that struck Ashvatham all like thunderbolts Ashvatham more rocked in his chariot, but kept his balance got hot catch fired another shaft that broke Ashvatham's bow. But he strung another one in a matter of seconds. By means of celestial weapons he shot hundreds of thousands of sky-ranging shafts with golden wings. Sorely oppressed by those arrows, the Rakshasa forces looked like a herd of elephants attacked by a lion. The shafts fell upon their broad chests and arms, piercing through their armor and digging into their leathery skins. Ashvatthama became like Shiva when he had destroyed the powerful Yasura Tripura in a long past age. His celestial weapons claimed the lives of countless Rakshasas. More and more of the demons appeared on the battlefield, rising up from the nether regions to join Gautatka Chat. They rushed in a body at Ashvatthama, wielding spike maces, scimitars, clubs, lances, axes, and many weapons unknown to men. They hurled them at Drona's son and roared exultantly. Seeing all the weapons falling on Ashvatthama, the Kauravas felt distressed, but Drona's son soon dispelled the attack with thousands of his own shafts. He emerged from the shower of missiles and destroyed the Rakshasas by celestial weapons. Fiery darts from his bow consumed the Rakshasa army Ashvatthama annihilated Gautatkacha's forces. With his eyes rolling in anger, Gautatkacha ordered his charioteer to charge Ashvatthama. He discharged arrows like poisonous serpents at Ashvatthama and checked his attack. Completely covering Drona's son with shafts resembling long barbed poles, Gautatkacha sent up a great roar. Other warriors entered the fight, some supporting Gautatkacha and others Ashvatthama Drishtad Yuna came up to Gautatkacha, while Shakuni and his followers supported Ashvatthama Drupada and his army attacked the Kauravas surrounding Duryodhan, with Bhima following him on his chariot, his mace whirling as he rushed into battle. As a fervent battle ensued between the armies, Ashvatthama suddenly released a shaft that looked like the rod held by death personified. Charged with the force of Indra's thunderbolt, it struck Atatkacha on the chest and threw him to the ground. Drishtadyuna saw him fall and he quickly took him up onto his own chariot and carried him away.